All right, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is the third in our weekly Archaeology and Preservation Month webinar series that is going to be happening until at least June. Uh, we'll keep in touch with you about that. Uh, before we get started, there are just a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. First, please check out our website for the full list of upcoming webinars. We're going to put the link in the chat window so you don't have to type it all out, but it is there on the screen as well. Second, if you have a question during the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A feature rather than the chat window so that we can keep track of your questions and make sure they all get answered. Uh, that'll be a little box at the, should be at the bottom of your screen, so hopefully you can see that on your menu. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please you do use the chat box for that, and one of our staff will try to assist you and answer any questions you have about the technology. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded, so you can use the original registration link uh, to go back and watch a recording of this at any time. It usually takes about an hour after the webinar for the recording to be available. So I guess I'll start off by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Eric Duvik, and I'm the Preservation Planner for History Colorado. I am joined today by Amy Unger and Jason O'Brien, who are both national and state register historians. And we all work in the preservation planning, planning unit of the Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And since we're covering so much material today, I asked Amy and Jason to come answer any questions that might come up doing, during the presentation. Uh, so feel free to ask those throughout at any time and they'll try to, to get back to you as soon as they can. So as I mentioned, we're going to be covering a lot of content in a very short amount of time today. So I'm not going to be going into a lot of detail on each topic. Uh, the goal is to help you gain some awareness of historic preservation practices and how they might affect you in your daily life. Uh, but as we go along, Jason and Amy will be providing links to some additional resources in the chat window. So you can get additional information if you're interested in a particular topic. So I will go ahead and note now that we won't be talking much today about archaeology because I'm not an archaeologist. <laughs> so I highly recommend tuning in for next week's webinar uh, to learn more about that topic from our assistant state archaeologist. And we'll post the link to the registration link for that webinar in the chat window. And there it is. So let's start at square one. Uh, if you are new to this, you may be wondering what exactly we mean by historic preservation. Essentially, it is the study, documentation, designation, protection, and physical preservation of buildings, the thing most of you are probably sitting in right now, structures, which are things like bridges and water towers, districts, uh, which are collections of these other types of resources, sites like battlefields or archaeological sites, and objects like statues and fountains. You may also hear these referred to in more general terms as cultural resources or historic properties. You'll hear me use that term a lot today. Uh, but the basic gist of it is that we are trying to save old stuff uh, <laughs> built by humans in our environment for future generations. So why do we do this work to preserve buildings and these other types of cultural resources? Uh, there's obviously numerous reasons, and you might have some that are personal to you or to your community, uh, but these listed here are the ones we hear about most often when it comes to historic preservation. Obviously, many communities take a lot of pride in highlighting their history and preserving their, these physical reminders of the past, and as a result, they also benefit from things like downtown revitalization and heritage tourism, uh, which is more than a $7 billion industry in Colorado. Or, of course, it was before, probably this year. Uh, but we also see that preservation provides space to develop small businesses and affordable housing because you're using existing building stock. Uh, this also creates more jobs than new construction because the work is focused on skilled labor rather than creating new materials. So provides more local jobs to people in, in your community. Um, if you would like to learn more about the benefits of historic preservation, I would recommend checking out our most recent statewide economic benefits study, 
and, and another great study called 24 Reasons Preservation is Good for Your Community. Uh, we're going to put, oh, there are the links in the chat window for both of those. So I highly recommend checking those out. So <laughs> to really understand historic preservation, uh, I think it's helpful to know about its history. I know, of course, we're going to have to do a history lesson. And of course, we could spend a few hours just on this topic today. So I'm going to talk about preservation only in the United States and just touch on some highlights. So bear with me. So in the past, preservation activities were largely supported by private individuals. And most often, uh, women had a prominent role in preservation, which incidentally, they still do today. Uh, the early goal was primarily to save individual landmark buildings for their historical associations rather than um, their architectural significance, although, of course, many were architecturally significant. Uh, a good example of this is the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which purchased George Washington's home, Mount Vernon, in 1858. So they are the oldest historic preservation organization in the United States, and they are still in operation today. So if you've ever been to Mount Vernon, you know about them. Uh, in 1889, we also saw the creation of the country's first statewide historic preservation group which was the Association for the Preservation of the Virginia Antiquities. I think today they've shortened it to Preserve Virgin Virginia or something like that. Uh, but anyway, they saved the powder magazine at Williamsburg uh, in that same year, 1889. So as you can see, the desire to preserve our history has been around for more than 150 years. Uh, the federal government began to take responsibility for protecting historic properties around the turn of the century. Also in 1889, the government took their first step to pr protect prehistoric archeological sites by creating the Goodman Point Archeological Reserve. That concern for archeological sites also resulted in President Theodore Roosevelt signing the Antiquities Act into law in 1906. And that authorized the president to declare by public proclamation, historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or scientific interest. That same year, the president also created the first national park intended to protect, uh, not the first national park, <laughs> the first national park intended to protect a location of cultural significance. Uh, and that was here at Colorado, Mesa Verde. Uh, things were then organized a bit more through the creation of the National Park Service in 1916. Uh, and of course, these activities only applied to sites on public lands, but private citizens and local governments were also getting involved in the preservation movement. Uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, they passed the country's first preservation ordinance to stop demolitions in their historic district. And then private organizations like the Colonial Dames and the Daughters of the American Revolution were also working across the country to save historic places. In response to the Great Depression, the federal government also employed citizens documenting historic buildings across the country. Uh, and we're going to post a link to the Library of Congress so you can take a look at some of the amazing documentation that came out of this program. It's called the Historic American Building Survey. And there's some really cool photos. That's the best part. Uh, <laughs> and lastly, the feds got things better organized in 1935 with the Historic Sites Act, uh, but more importantly, explicitly stated for the first time that historic preservation was a national policy. So fast forwarding a bit, of course, uh, Americans got a little bit distracted in the 1940s by some other things happening in the world. Uh, and then in the 1950s and 60s, the American landscape changed dramatically thanks to the rise in popularity of the automobile primarily. Uh, so more and more people moved to the suburbs to you know, chase the American dream. And so we saw America's downtowns were abandoned in favor of shopping malls and massive housing developments. So what was left of our towns and cities fell into dis to disrepair. So property owners responded by trying to give people what they thought they wanted. Um, so buildings were demolished to create parking lots so you could drive downtown. Commercial main streets were covered over with new storefronts to look more modern, more like the shopping malls that they saw in the suburbs. So here's some very illustrative photos of downtown Denver before and after this time period. So you can use the clock tower as a reference to understand just how many buildings were lost during this time. 
The interstate highway system was also created during this time, which also impacted our downtowns in a pretty major way, both for big cities and small ones. Uh, in the bigger cities, the interstate destroyed entire neighborhoods, uh, usually those where people of color lived, or they cut neighborhoods off from pedestrian access and, and destroyed them in that way. Uh, in smaller communities, the interstate bypassed them completely and destroyed their economies in the process because they lost all of the tourism and that highway traffic. So clearly I'm oversimplifying some very complex issues in American history, and I'm not even going to address things like redlining or public housing. Uh, the moral of the story, what I want you to understand is that we were losing buildings and lo losing our sense of community in the process. And so some people started to take notice. The U.S. Conference of Mayors formed a special committee on historic preservation, which authored a document called With Heritage So Rich, complete with a foreword by Lady Bird Johnson. And so this is in 1966. And so we're going to put a link to the document in the chat window as well. Uh, but the important thing to know is that this group not only called out what was happening in America, but identified a path to perhaps help fix these problems. So in response, uh, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which created the historic preservation movement as we know it today. So the act created several programs that we still use today, and it also created formal processes by which state and local governments could work with the federal government to preserve historic property, so we we're all working together. It also set our national policy, so we were all working under the same program, standards, and ideas that could then be adapted to what was happening in our states and communities. Uh, one of the most important parts of the act was the formalized partnership it created between local government, states, and the federal government. Uh, so the National Park Service is tasked with managing preservation programs on the national level for reasons that are hopefully a bit clearer after a little history lesson. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act requires that each state create a state historic preservation office to carry out various responsibilities listed in the act. So in Colorado, History Colorado's Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation serves that role. And the head of History Colorado is known as, also known as the State Historic Preservation Officer, or SHPO. <laughs> You will often hear this acronym pronounced as SHPO, uh, but I will try to avoid using that for the rest of the <laughs> presentation, uh, but that's a good one to know. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act was amended in 1980 to add a local government partnership through what is known as the Certified Local Government Program, and that also happens to be the program that I manage. So this is a group of cities, towns, and counties that have passed their own preservation legislation through an ordinance. Uh, and we'll post a link to the list of certified local governments in the chat window as well, so you can check that out and see if your local government happens to be included. And it's also worth noting that, of course, historic preservation still happens privately as well. On the national level, there is the National Trust for Historic Preservation, here in Colorado, our statewide nonprofit is Colorado Preservation Inc. And then on the local level, it, it really varies, but you might have a local historical society or maybe an even uh, an organization specifically for historic preservation, such as Historic Larimer County. Oh good, they shared the uh, <laughs> link to Colorado Preservation Inc. in the chat window as well. So now that you have an idea of who the players are in historic preservation, let's take a look at the activities and programs that we use to accomplish our preservation goals. The preservation process usually begins with survey and inventory, which is most commonly referred to as survey. Uh, survey is the ongoing process of locating and describing building sites, structures, and districts of potential local, state, or national importance. So this is a good time to point out that well, historically, preservation focused on properties that were of national importance. Uh, with the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, we had like a, a formal recognition that the importance of, uh, of locally significant sites as well. So uh, getting back to survey, the primary goal is to document historic properties. 
so that they can be evaluated for their significance for the various levels of registration that exist. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the different registers here in a minute, but the main takeaway is that we want to understand why a property is important and if it is important on the national, state, or local level. Surveying a property includes several steps and it can vary depending on the type of property, but it primarily includes field work, uh, which, is going, which is going out and looking at the property and taking photos of it, archival research where you can gather information on the property's history and how it may have changed over time, interviews usually with past or current property owners to learn more about the property, and lastly, everyone's favorite is data entry, <laughs> where you enter all this information into a form. Uh, and so everyone in the state of Colorado uh, uses the same forms to make things easier to find and to make it easier to share that information um, in our database. So here's a list of the different types of data we usually gather for a property. And of course, for this example, I'm primarily talking about historic buildings. Uh, that's going to be construction dates, both original construction dates and dates of additions or any changes to the building. Uh, historic and current uses, what was the property used for, has it changed, ownership, property history, um, areas of potential significance, so what makes this property important, current condition, uh, which is always nice to know for future reference, uh, photographs, both current and historic, if you can find them, and maps, especially a topographic map, so we know exactly where the pro property is located. So as I mentioned, part of the survey process is evaluating properties for their significance. And this significance is formalized through listing in a historic register. So the National Register of Historic Places is another program created by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Uh, on the state level, we have its counterpart called the State Register of Historic Properties. Both registers honor significant cultural resources in our state and make them eligible for various financial incentives. So without getting into the specifics of the programs, uh, I think it's important to note that eligibility for the National State Registers is based on both significance and integrity. So properties are evaluated for their significance using four national criteria and five state criteria. Then they are evaluated for their integrity, which is the ability of a property to convey its significance through its physical features or characteristics. Both significance and integrity are required for a property to, to be eligible. <coughs> so if you want to learn more about these programs, please check out our previous webinar uh, using the link in the chat window. Uh, that was from two weeks ago now, uh, which Amy and Jason did for us. Uh, I should also note right now that there's a common misconception that listing on either register provides automatic protection for historic properties, and sadly I'm here to tell you that is not the case. <laughs> uh, listing on the National and State Registers places no restrictions on a property, and a private property owner is free to designate their building one day and tear it down the next. Protections really only happen on the local level, so let's start discussing that. So in addition to the national and state registers, your city, town, or county might also have a local register. The criteria for this local register will be described in your local preservation ordinance, and new nominations to that register are typically approved by a local historic preservation commission or board. So just like the national and state register, eligibility for designation is usually based on the significance of the property and the integrity it retains. Individually designated properties and contributing properties in the district are eligible for various financial incentives, depending on their designation as well as protections. So let's take a look at those. So <laughs> here I've tried to perhaps oversimplify the effects of listing at each level so it's easy for you to see. I will also point out uh, at this point that you might hear different terms for listing on a historic register, so such as designation or landmarking, uh, they all basically mean the same thing. So they're all synonyms. So I'm probably going to use the word designation here moving forward. So as you can see, uh, restrictions on properties can only happen on the local level. 
And even then, it can be optional. Uh, each community is different, so that's why you see a lot of maybes on this chart. <laughs> I highly recommend looking into what the rules are for your own community so you can better understand, you know, what the impact is of those laws. I will note that federal and state governments may have to jump through some additional hoops when they are working with or funding work on historic properties, and we're going to discuss that shortly. Uh, but ultimately, they are still not protected in the way that a local um, designation protects them. The good thing to know is the incentives for listing. Uh, so federal tax credits, state tax credits, state grants, and potentially a whole set of local incentives are available once a property is listed. Of course, I'm saving that info for the end of the preservation, uh, presentation, so you're going to have to stick around. So let's discuss those uh, protections for historic properties a bit more. Uh, part of the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106 to be exact, uh, outlines a process for how formally or how federally funded or permitted projects must assess their impact on historic properties. So this is somewhat similar to the way the federal government has to consider uh, environmental impacts under NEPA, if you're familiar with that. Uh, here in Colorado, we also have the State Register Act, which follows a similar process to the um, National Historic Preservation Act. And like I said before, these processes ultimately can't stop a project from moving forward, but if all parties are acting in good faith, uh, we can hopefully avoid or mitigate impacts to historic properties. And if you would like to learn more about this process, uh, be sure to join us on May 27th for our webinar. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about the federal process known as Section 106, and we have put the link to that one in the chat window. So locally designated properties may be reviewed by a local Historic Preservation Board or Commission in a process we call design review. The process is outlined in the local ordinance and compliance with the decisions made by the board may be voluntary or mandatory. The process is different for each community, uh, but whatever decisions are made must be consistent with the criteria listed in the ordinance. So they need to be legally defensible. Um, communities may also develop design guidelines to further define the local requirements for additions or new construction in historic districts or for individually designated properties. And of course, this is the point where many people can become frustrated with historic preservation. So let's discuss the how and why of these decisions. So hopefully you can uh, get that background and have a better understanding of where they're coming from. So since the National Park Service Service manages preservation programs, and the Park Service is located in the Department of the Interior. The standards we follow are called the Secretary of the Interior Standards, uh, though I really doubt the Secretary of the Interior has read them, but who knows. Um, there are standards and guidelines for a variety of things, but the ones you're going to hear about most often are for the treatment of historic properties. So you may hear some of these terms used interchangeably, but when it comes to historic preservation, uh, they have very specific meanings when we're talking about them. So first one is preservation, which is basically maintenance, and that is the ideal treatment approach if possible. Uh, the next one is restoration, which is bringing a building back to a certain point in time. Uh, we don't see this one very often because, um, you know, modern updates and changes are usually necessary to a building. Rehabilitation which is also known as adaptive reuse, is perhaps the most common and the one most communities use in their design review process. This is the alteration of a building for a new or updated use while retaining its historic character. And then reconstruction, which is exactly what it sounds like, uh, and that's also relatively rare and only used in special circumstances. So, Let's, sorry, having technical issues here. <laughs> okay, so let's discuss rehabilitation since it is the most common treatment approach. Um, so as I said, it's the process of returning a property to a state of utility through repair or alteration, uh, which makes possible an efficient contemporary use uh, 
while preserving, you know, basically preserving what makes the building significant um, and those features, uh, architectural historic features. So here we can see an example of a rehabilitation, uh, which was an automobile, automobile garage converted to office space. Um, and we're also going to post in the chat window now um, some illustrated guidelines for uh, these standards so you can uh, follow along if you'd like or uh, get more specific questions answered. So I'm going to go through all 10 standards as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, I'm just going to briefly touch on them, but like I said, check out that link for the guidelines if you would like more information on these. So standard number one is to choose an appropriate use. Um, so this says that a property will be used as it was historically or be given, given a new use that requires minimal change to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. So here we can see some examples of uh, a new use that is not appropriate, a historic theater in Detroit that was turned into a parking garage. And obviously we lost a lot of historic features in the process, so that would not be an appropriate use. Um, the bottom example is a gas station that was turned into a restaurant. So that required very minimal changes to the historic character of the building, um, so that would be appropriate. Number two is to retain historic character. The historic character of the property will be retained and preserved. Removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaces, spaces and spatial relationships that characterize a property will be avoided. So, uh, the main takeaway here is that small changes can make a big difference, uh, especially when they are multiplied. As you can see in the top photo here, uh, we see the historic house. I mean, they're both historic houses, but the one that has retained its features on the left and one that has lost them on the right. Um, and this can be simple things, you know, just siding changes as we're seeing on the bottom photos here. Uh, that can change the depth of windows. Uh, and, you know, if you have a lot of these smaller changes, it can have a big impact on the uh, historic character of the property. Number three, ensure that building uh, tells true story of development. So uh, we actually see this more often um, than I would like, uh, but it's pretty surprising that people are willing to put forth a lot of effort to add you know, conjectural features to a building or, you know, just fake historic things that they think would look nice, uh, but that the building never had. So here we have an example of a historic home that had craftsman details added, uh, even though it was never, you know, obviously never a craftsman house. So you just want to avoid making things up is essentially what standard number three is. Uh, standard number four, retain historic changes if they are significant. Uh, so obviously, you know, buildings change over time and we need to respect that. Um, and the National and State Register criteria are written in such a way that it does respect those changes over time if they happened historically. Uh, so here we have a nice example from a building in, I believe this is in Leadville, that had some changes to the storefront on the bottom level in the 1950s. Obviously it was built in, uh, let's see, 1910. Uh, but those 1950s changes are now historic as well, and so they are now significant in their own right, and so we would want to preserve those as well. And here's another good example of changes over time that you would want to preserve. Um, because this is rehabilitation and not a restoration, uh, we want to keep the bottom storefront, even though it is not what was originally there, it's still the historic storefront. Number five, retain character defining features. And if at this point you're, sound, you're thinking this all sounds a little repetitive, that's because it is. Uh, we're just trying to <laughs> preserve historic materials. Um, so, you know, character defining features that can be, you know, historic details like doors, windows. Uh, here we see the brick pointing techniques. Um, as a whole, these can all make a big difference on the integrity of the property. And number six, this one's pretty easy. We want to repair rather than replace. Uh, so we most often see this with windows. Uh, we want to repair historic windows rather than replacing them. Uh, if, if a feature is missing and so it has to be replaced, uh, you wanna make sure that's substantiated by documentary and physical evidence rather than just what you think might should 
go there. Number seven is also pretty easy. When cleaning, use the gentlest means possible. Uh, really, all this means is please, please, please do not sandblast your building. Uh, <laughs> um, you just want to make sure you're using the gentlest means that you can to achieve whatever you're trying to. So here we can see a good example of some bricks that have been horrifically damaged by sandblasting. And then compared to this person that's just uh, washing some stones with soap and water to, to get some build up off. That would be the ideal. Number eight, uh, protect archeological resources. So this one's also pretty straightforward. If you are, you know, if your project involves digging or you just happen to have some on your site, uh, you just wanna make sure that if you have to disturb archeological resources, that mitigation measures will be undertaken in the process. So that's a great one to ask, to come to the webinar next week and ask our assistant state archeologist about. So uh, standards nine and 10 have to do with additions. So number nine is to design sympathetic additions. So new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction will not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize the property. Uh, more importantly, the new work will be differentiated from the old and will be compatible with the historic materials, features, size, scale, and proportion. So obviously that's, um, a little more vague than the other ones. There's a lot of ways that you can design an addition that's going to be appropriate. So there's no, you know, black and white, yes, no, this is going to be a good addition and this isn't. And that's when we can run into some um, difficulties, you know, with the design review process I was talking about. Uh, but the nice thing is there's a lot of room for uh, creativity in the process. So you know, if an architect is designing an addition, uh, there's lots of options. And so here we have an example of a sympathetic addition. Um, obviously, it's the basically for an entryway and elevator access on the right. You know, the addition is set back, but they've tried to carry over similar colors, um, the rhythm of the windows. Um, it's all similar materials, you know, brick, but it's not exactly the same. So they haven't made it look as if it were there all along, uh, but you don't, you know, your eyes aren't drawn to it. That's the goal. And then number 10 is to make additions reversible. Um, so that just means, you know, if you have to remove the addition in the future, you want to make sure that you've still retained the integrity of the historic property um, and that it's not ruined beyond repair. So we see that a lot. Um, you know, if you were going to add a second floor to a house, obviously that's going to irreparably change that house. So, you know, that would not meet this standard. But if you're going to add an addition to the rear, as we can see in this example, uh, you can make that entrance through an existing window or an existing door. So if you were to take off that addition at some point in the future, uh, all you would have to do is put that door back. So, that is <laughs> the fastest I've ever gone through those standards, but hopefully that just gives you a nice little taste of um, what to expect if you ever have to go through the design review process. And so now that you've sat through that, I will start telling you about the incentives for historic preservation. This is the fun stuff. Um, so what exactly do you get for following all these rules? On the local level, it's going to depend, as I've said, for everything else. Um, each community is different. They all have different incentives. Uh, here's just a list of some different types of incentives that might exist in your community. Uh, sales tax rebate, lower zero interest loans, exemptions and variances. So you might get those from your planning department or your planning commission. Uh, technical assistance, you might have, you know, professional preservation staff on for your um, local government that are there to help you and could advise you on what to do. Um, there might also be easements. Uh, property tax rebates, and some communities even have their own grant program. So it's definitely worth, worth looking into. On the state and federal level, as I mentioned, we have the tax credits. Uh, we have the State Historical Fund, which is our state grant program, and I'm going to go over these in more detail. Uh, there's also a revolving loan fund through the Colorado Historical Foundation. 
and then the federal rehabilitation tax credit. So let's talk about rehabilitation tax credits real quick. So you all already know what a rehabilitation is. We've gone over that in probably more detail than you wanted. Um, but hopefully you know what a tax credit is as well. That's something that directly reduces the amount of tax owed to the government. So that's different from a deduction. So a dollar of credit equals a dollar in tax reduction. That's gonna be based on the percentage of the total project cost. So for example, if you had a 20% tax credit for your project and $100,000 in cost, uh, you would get $20,000 in tax credits. Um, so there's two types of tax credits. There's the federal and the state. On the federal level, that is only available for commercial or income producing properties. In the state, uh, we have that available for commercial as well as residential properties. So if you're a private homeowner, but you have a designated property, you could be eligible for a tax credit. Just to make this super clear, uh, when I say commercial, I mean income producing. So that can be uh, a rental property. Uh, we're going to consider that as a commercial tax credit rather than a residential one. Residential is just when you, when it's owned by you and you live there, or it's your second home and you're not renting it out for additional income. So here's a list of what costs are allowable for these tax credits. So we call these QREs, the Qualified Rehabilitation Expenditures. Um, so it's basically all the materials and labor that would go into your projects, so roofing, siding, masonry, windows, etc. Uh, things that are not allowed is acquisitions. Obviously, you can't use the tax credit to purchase property. Um, you can't use it to add a non-historic addition to your property. Uh, can't be used for landscaping or site work. And basically, any removable fixtures, legal fees, stuff like that. So here's another oversimplified um, table for you where I've tried to contain it all into one slide for you uh, for, for the tax credits. But if you want to learn more about the tax credits, we're going to put a link in the chat window so you can go to our website and, and learn more about each of these. Um, so as you can see, you know, there's different requirements for uh, where the property is listed, whether it's listed on the national, state, or local register, how much of the credit is available. So anywhere from 20% to uh, up to 35% if you get um, bonuses. Um, so there's a disaster area relief bonus. If you're in a county that has been declared a disaster area, and then we also have a bonus for uh, rural areas, which is, you know, most of our state. So you might be eligible for that as well. Um, another thing worth pointing out on the tax credits is that our state commercial tax credits can be transferred or sold. So we do have some nonprofit organizations that take advantage of those and then sell them um, to help them fund their projects. So that's a very nice benefit. So the State Historical Fund, uh, the State Historical Fund is actually housed in History Colorado and they are our office neighbors and our close partners that we work with. Um, and this is the grant program that is funded uh, from the limited stakes <laughs> gaming in Cripple Creek, Central City, and Blackhawk. So a portion of that money is set aside specifically for historic preservation. So that's where this money comes from. They offer uh, two types of grants, non-competitive and competitive. Uh, the non-competitive include archaeological assessments, historic structure assessments, emergency grants, uh, as well as survey plans, which is not listed here on the slide, but that is another thing that they offer. Um, competitive grants are the most common, and those are for acquisition and development, archaeology, education, and survey and planning. And I think... Yeah, we will put the uh, link to the State Historical Fund website in the chat window as well, so you can go there and, and learn more about them. Um, right now, they have two uh, application deadlines per year in February and in August, I mean, in April and October. <laughs> um, and then award notification uh, depends on whether you ask for less than $35,000 or more than $35,000. So. You can learn more about them on their website, and I highly recommend that. I know most communities in the state have already taken advantage of the State Historical Fund and received a grant, so it's a great program. Um, 
Another thing I want you to be aware of is the Rocky Mountain Center for Preservation. Uh, so this is like brand new here in Colorado. It is located in Leadville at the Healy House Museum, if you've ever been there. Um, so this is an educational resource for training and preservation and its trades in Colorado. And so I highly recommend uh, checking out their website. We'll put that in the chat window as well. Um, and specifically go to their Facebook page because that's where they're going to be posting all of their training opportunities. So they were having uh, window workshops and Adobe workshops. Obviously a lot of that has been canceled now, but as soon as we are able to, I know that they're going to be uh, offering those again. So be sure to check that out. And to wrap up, uh, just a couple more things. Preservation organizations that you would want to be aware of. Uh, we already talked about some of these. Uh, if you happen to be part of a Historic Preservation Commission, I also recommend checking out the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. So that's uh, a group of preservation commissions from all across the country. Um, that's a great resource. They have a conference every other year that you should check out. Uh, here in the state, we've already talked about History Colorado. Uh, Colorado Preservation Inc. does an amazing conference every year in uh, early January, February called the Saving Places Conference. So if you're interested in getting it into historic preservation, that's a great conference to check out. Uh, Colorado Main Street, uh, that is housed in the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. That's a, another great resource of preservation. If you're involved in, you know, downtown revitalization in your community, um, they're a great one to check out. Uh, the Colorado Historical Foundation, I mentioned them for those uh, low interest loans. And then the Colorado Archaeological Society, uh, you can also check out their website. And then I think that is, I think that is it. So obviously I know I've covered a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, and we're only really scratching the surface here. Uh, but we do have more webinars coming up that are going to cover each of these topics in more detail. Uh, and you can always utilize the resources on our website, which is listed here, historycolorado.org slash preserve. Um, and then I've also listed the National Park Service website, uh, so you can take a look at their website for historic preservation. So I will check out the Q&A and see if we have any open questions, but I'm sure Jason and Amy have already answered those, hopefully. Or maybe we haven't had any. Uh, so we had a question about how to access one of the slides. Um, so like I said, we'll have the recording and if you would like to send me an email, I can email you uh, a copy of the presentation so you can have a copy of all the slides. And if you're a member of a CLG and you are attending this uh, webinar for your training, uh, this webinar will also be posted on our CLG website, uh, so you guys will also have access to that. Okay, so it looks like we do have a question. If a site is on the National Register and it's a place, not a building, and on federal land, does it require Section 106 before altering it? Uh, so yes, is the short answer. <laughs> um, they will have to go through the process to identify whether or not it is eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, but obviously it's going to depend on the situation. 